Um, I'm Ruth Shapiro, and I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Um, even though I know it wasn't really me that you're here to see, but our three very preeminent um, speakers at the panel discussion after I give you this brief overview. When the Center for Asian Philanthropy and Society, CAPS, is headquartered in Hong Kong, but we work across 18 economies in Asia, so 16 countries plus Hong Kong and Taiwan. And our mission is to increase both the quality and quantity of all types of private social investment in the region. Um, so it's philanthropy, it's CSR, it's impact investing, any way in which private resources are brought to bear on doing good. When I was creating CAPS and doing the feasibility study for this, I went around and I interviewed many, many high net worth and ultra high net worth individuals around the region. And I would ask, why don't you give more locally? And a number of them, most of them, said, well, we don't trust the local organizations to receive our money. And it became very clear that there is a profound trust deficit operating throughout Asia. And in some ways, no country is more emblematic of the trust deficit than this one. Um, and the trust deficit really makes it difficult to work across sectors. If people don't trust nonprofits, if they don't, if the private sector doesn't trust government, if government doesn't trust the private sector or, or nonprofits, then it's very hard to collaborate. And collaborate we must do. Our problems are big. So the whole purpose of the Doing Good Index was to say, are there system fixes? Can we put into place mechanisms to increase accountability, increase transparency, and then build trust. So that was the original kind of operating and uh, genesis idea behind this Doing Good Index. The index is robust, as Anakshi said, and I want to just um, thank our two partners, GuideStar India, Pushpa Singh is with us tonight, and the Center for the Advancement of Philanthropy, Nashir Dajrawala, who is also with us. Um, in each, we're a tiny nonprofit based in Hong Kong, tiny but powerful. Um, but we rely on our partners throughout the region. And so they are the ones who collect the data, send it to us where we do the analysis, and then we come back. So tonight I'm going to very quickly walk through some of the findings. Whoops. I'm already, let me see, already going ahead. OK, well. Let me just start then, <laughs> since it's already gone on to the next slide. Um, so as in actually said, um, COVID's been hard. And when we did this study, we never thought in, that we'd three years later be still talking about this, but yet we are. And um, it, while COVID did not create any new trends, it did accelerate existing trends. Some of them, like the use of digital tools, online services, the notion of community really stepping up and helping each other, those were good. But the majority of trends were bad. Income disparity, educational disparity, social disparities have all increased. Um, what we know is that we need to come out of this pandemic with some new ways of thinking, new ways of working together. And I'm pleased that you know, in our discussion following this, we're going to talk about some of those new ways and how we can collaborate. But the trust deficit continues to wreak havoc on the, uh, on the sector as a whole. And I'm going to show how in India that's really the case. The Doing Good Index, as Anakshi said, covers 17 economies. In it's the third iteration. We did it in 2018, 2020, and 2022. This year, not surprisingly, we could not collect data in Myanmar because of obvious reasons there. But there is a, um, a short paper on the situation in Myanmar, which is extremely unfortunate, as we know. Um, there are some hard copies. I think some of you have them. The whole index is available on our website. And the other very cool feature of this index is that there's a microsite attached to it. And you can actually play with the data. So you can compare India with China. You can compare India with Nepal. You can compare India 2020 with India 2022. 
um, and really play around with the data, which is fun. Um, together with our partners, we did survey 2,239 nonprofits and social enterprises. We use the term social delivery organizations. And let me tell you, this survey takes 45 minutes to an hour to fill out. So to get this number, to spend that much time, is quite an extraordinary feat, and really because of our partners' relationships on the ground. GuideStar, as you may know, has 11,000 nonprofit organizations on its platform in India. And with our help, help with our partners, we interviewed 126 experts. The index is made up of four tranche of indicators. Three of them have to do with government, regulations, tax and fiscal policies, and procurement. One of them is ecosystem. Essentially, does the society embrace the notion of giving back? Are there mechanisms to enhance philanthropy? Are there recognitions? Are there awards? Is this something that is important to the communities and to the society? This year, we also included a section on COVID because it's been such a, a major blow, um, not only to the social sector, but to all of us. <clears throat> so in the index, there are four clusters. And these are in alphabetical order within clusters, so this is not a league table particularly. The ones that do best are Singapore and Taiwan, and why is that? Because the governments in Singapore and Taiwan see the nonprofit sector, the social sector, philanthropy and nonprofits as an integral partner in getting the job done, in delivering goods and services to their citizenry. In all the others, the government has some mixed feelings about the sector. And it's going to play out in ways that I'm going to show you. And I can answer some of the questions about why different groups are in this category. China was in doing OK last time, and now it's, it's actually put in place a number of processes that allowed it to move up. Um, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka dropped down because of the internal situations in those two countries. And during the Q&A, which will happen after the panel, I'm ha all fair in terms of questions regarding this index. So how can India do better? Well, we need to mitigate the trust deficit through clear and consistent regulations and policies particularly. And we need to have greater collaboration, which leverages the comparative strengths of the private sector, the government sector, and the social sector. We need to play to the strengths of all of them and allow them to work together. Easier said than done. The impact of COVID. Of the ones that responded to our survey, 95% of the organizations said that they offered frontline services during COVID for the pandemic. That was the highest in all of Asia, 95%. 70% saw increased demand for their services and products that are not COVID related. These are organizations that are working in other areas, right? In education, environment, and community development. They had to pivot to address COVID and continue to do what they were doing before the pandemic. And yet, 61% reported a decrease in the number of donors. And we know that for many donors, the funding became zero sum which was hard for the organizations that were re uh, relying on that support. The story for India is that there are ambivalent signals from government. On the one hand, the Indian government has put into place the CSR legislation that we all know about. They have created a social stock exchange, which launched this past week and, and, and could really be a game changer in terms of legitimating the social sector. So the government is saying, with these types of initiatives, we want you to participate. We want you to be engaged. And we are incentivizing you to do so. And in the case of the CSR legislation, we're telling you to do so. But on the other hand, increased FCRA measures and very confusing tax requirements kind of take away from that, from that plus side. And so these organizations are left with a little bit of a confusing message coming from the government of India. How are regulations? 
Well, actually, we have helped to incubate a, a, another organization called the Center for Asian Philanthropy in India, CAPI. And because of the new automated system, it took 50 less days to incorporate CAPI than it would have previous to the automated system. So that's great. The government is trying to um, make the system more efficient. Also, people say that since 2020, 71% up seven percentage points say that laws are enforced. Now, we might not think it's always so great to enforce the laws, but actually it's generally a good thing because we want clarity, we want sustainability, we want to know how to stay on the right side of the law. But what else is happening? 75% of respondents said that the rules are difficult to understand. And I don't know how many of you have ever spent time trying to navigate a government of India legal like website explaining the rules and requirements. I have, and I think you could get a PhD just in understanding the website of the government of India. Very difficult. Um, so in, the government could do a lot better job of communicating these, these rules and procedures because people want to stay above, you know, within the law. We noticed a pretty significant decrease in the number of organizations that are involved in policy consultations. So it went down from 14% to 10%, still very low. So the government is not doing such a great job of asking these organizations what they need and what their role is and what the government should be doing. And um, the, today is Wednesday. On Monday, we released a press release. And my colleague, Pushpa Singh, said in that press release, which was picked up on a, in a number of newspapers here in India, that the government went through a very deliberative, consultative, inclusive process to create the social stock exchange. So it's possible. And we should do that when it comes to the regulations and rules regarding the social sector more broadly. India is only one of three economies, with Malaysia and Hong Kong being the other two, that does not require the submission of an annual report to the government. Annual, annual financial statements, yes. Annual report, no. Not only do we think submission of annual reports is important, we call upon governments to make those re annual reports public. Why not? If you want to increase accountability and transparency, there's almost no a better way to do that. The other thing that's confusing is taxes. Now, not everybody collects taxes, and in India has gotten better to a fault at collecting taxes, I guess. Um, but taxes have two purposes. One is they align incentives. They put real money, tax subsidies, put real money back in the pockets of donors. But they also are a very effective signaling tool. They tell you what the government wants. So Singapore, if you look at it, has the highest tax subsidy in the world, 250% for individuals and corporations. That means for every dollar you give, two and a half dollars are Ta taken off your tax bill. Um, that's incredible. And when you signal to people you want them to engage in that way, they do. India has kind of a mixed, what is the message here? Um, many of you know that you can get 100% subsidy for certain activities. You can get 100% for giving to PM Cares, CM Cares, and certain national nonprofits such as the National Association of the Blind, and plan, um, family planning association. But most cases, you get a 50% and it's capped. So even if you wanted to give your whole salary away, you wouldn't get a tax subsidy in India. Why? What's the message there? <clears throat> There's other ways that government can support the sector. They can give grants. And this really um, went up from 37 to 42%. These are grants to the nonprofit sector, still a relatively small proportion of a nonprofit's budget. But the area that the government in, in India could really improve is through procurement. We 
think that when a government procures services and products from the nonprofit sector, it legitimizes them, it gives them a sustainable income stream, and it says to the community, we trust these organizations to deliver health care, to deliver services to the disabled, to help in schools, whatever it is. Um, and we can talk about why this is the case. India is one of the lowest in terms of procurement. The highest is China. 72% of nonprofit organizations in China get procurement contracts from the government. Now, you can say that's the government controlling the nonprofit sector in China, and the answer is yes, but it's a win-win. So um, not to say that that's going to happen in India, nor should it. India and China are very different, but they do represent essentially two sides of how the government interacts. Companies can do a lot more. And yes, we have a CSR legislation here, and that's good for the top 18,000 or so, but there's plenty of other companies besides those 18,000. Um, Court, these numbers stayed roughly the same during the pandemic, which is good. Um, so the prevalence of organizations getting corporate support remained around 50%. It went down in terms of the overall proportion, because what I mentioned earlier is um, organizations, SDOs, or nonprofits are getting money from corporations, but they got less during COVID because there was this zero-sum phenomenon. Corporations can do more but, than fund. Of course, every, all nonprofits, if, you, if any of you have ever worked with a nonprofit, know that we're always begging for money. Um, it's always a cash drop situation. So funding is important, but it's not the only thing. Um, corporations can donate goods and services, and they can really lend expertise. Those nonprofits need help with accounting, with financial planning, with marketing, with HR. Those are all skills within companies that could be deployed to nonprofits. India talent remains a challenge, and that's true everywhere. One reason is because nonprofit um, personnel make a lot less, and we know that. Um, and so we call upon funders to provide living to help support living wages for those working for nonprofit organizations and also to help build capacity. Capacity building is very difficult to fundraise for, and yet it's very important. Even if you're willing to forego a, a, like a top-notch, you know, investment banking salary to work at a nonprofit, you still want to learn and grow and develop as a professional. And capacity building is important, critical to that. Not only that, but during COVID, many of these organizations didn't have the technical skills to be able to put their services online. And they had to build capacity to do that by begging, to use, to, to use an English expression, begging, but borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. Technology is part of the solution, though. 62% increased online services during COVID. 82% started using more technology during their daily operations. 90% say they intend to crowdfund. Now, crowdfunding is a mixed bag. It's terrific for some organizations. Usually, it's a retail type. It allows widespread support for a cause. Most of those causes, however, are heartstring causes. So a sick child, or someone was in an accident, or something terrible happened, someone's raising money, and you have a very human tendency to want to help, which is terrific. It's just very hard to do crowdfunding for structural change, for systemic change, and that's what we need. So those are some of the findings from the Doing Good Index. I want to thank you. And Please do look at our report online. And now I'm going to ask our three speakers to come on up. Um, so we're going to have a conversation. Um, but we have a really terrific audience here tonight. And um, I just want to ask, raise your hand if you are either have given money away philanthropically or you've ever worked or volunteered for a nonprofit organization. Wow. Yay. 
That means we should have some really good questions. So I'm not going to uh, monopolize the conversation. I'm just going to kick it off, and I really hope that all that collective wisdom out there is um, directed toward questions or comments um, after we have our discussion. So we're very fortunate tonight because we have three committed philanthropists who have very, very different philosophies about their philanthropy and ways of operating. So I'd like to ask the three of you to talk about your personal you know, philosophy on, on um, your philanthropy and how it has evolved over the years. Anybody want to go first? Jamshid? Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Ruth, and welcome uh, to all our guests here uh, this evening. Uh, well, you know, I have uh, uh, believed that uh, it's not only about uh, the monetary contribution that individuals make to nonprofits. I think it's got a lot to do with uh, getting involved personally and giving of your time. I think that's, in fact, in many ways, uh, you know, uh, more important than the monetary uh, aspect of what you're giving. And I think that when you get involved in an organization and know it uh, uh, deeply, you know, it becomes a lot easier to uh, uh, understand the organization and provide the funds that it needs for various uh, aspects, such as capacity building, as you said. So my, that's what I have uh, spent a lot of uh, my time with the organizations I'm collected with. Uh, being on their boards, being involved uh, very much uh, and deeply in their uh, workings. Uh, so that's basically my uh, sort of uh, thinking about them. I do believe that, uh, uh, you know, uh, personally I have, uh, uh, you know, India is a country which has uh, needs for almost anything and everything as far as philanthropy is concerned. And uh, so, I mean, when you have to choose, it's, uh, it's, it becomes a very personal thing. And uh, I think my family background and my own uh, interest uh, has been on environmental issues. And uh, that's what I have uh, spent a lot of time on. But in the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, a lot of that of, uh, has been on things to do with uh, energy, energy policy, energy access, uh, and and the policy that surrounds that. And I think that uh, uh, the organizations I'm connected with have done uh, an enormous amount of uh, mind change uh, with uh, governments, uh, state governments, central governments, but also with entrepreneurs about what the possibility is uh, on uh, energy. Uh, and of course, there are many other issues that are equally pressing, if not more, but I found that in India, uh, mostly people would give uh, for health care and education. And uh, there's a lot that happens there. And, and that sector needs it enormously. And it's, it's uh, very vibrant. But I have felt, you know, as you said, what, what's your personal interest is that environment has been the one which I would have liked, which I have you know, spent most of my time, money, and effort on. Thank you very much. And um, Jumshid is not actually being completely truthful. He spends a lot of time on environment, but he's on the board of the Center for Asian Philanthropy and Society and the Center for Asian Philanthropy in India, and he is one terrific board member that I appreciate so much. So um, his guidance and wisdom are integral, and the money. <laughs> but mostly the guidance and wisdom, um, which is, is so important. Rani, no, sorry, Serena. Okay, so, so hi everyone, and thank you very much for having me here today, Ruth and Akshi. Um, and I agree with Jamshed, I think philanthropy is a very personal choice. It needs to be your passion, you need to love it, you need to really want to do it, um, and you need to sustain it. And it's a lot of hard work, and it's a lot of failure, and a lot of heartbreak, but there are also a lot of triumphs and wonderful moments. And probably, I think, in the last 
10 years of this journey. My journey has been, I think we started Swadesh as Share 20 years ago, but in the last 10 years, we've really given it our heart and our soul, and we really worked on it really hard. And um, Zarina, maybe you could just say what Swadesh does. Sorry, yes, I'm going to get to that. Okay. So, um, so the Swadesh Foundation, which started around 10 years ago, is basically the idea is to create a model of rural development which is sustainable and allows us to exit. And our dream is to create a model that will lift a million people out of poverty every five years. And right now, after a lot of hard work, struggle, all the rest of it, we're at the quarter million mark. Um, meaning our reach is approximately a quarter million. It doesn't mean we reach every single person as yet, but we're working on that. Well, that's one. We have a 360, it's quite unique, but now when we started, it was like, you guys are crazy, this is not the way to go, do one thing and do it well was the advice we received. But we decided to do a 360 degree holistic model of development. The other thing is we put the community at the center of change. And this is the essence of Swades. That is why the name Swades. And our motto is Swa Se Bane Des, which is I make my country. I make the change. And at our heart is this rural empowerment processes, which I'm, I think if you ask me what I'm the most proud of, see we do work in water, we do work in toilets, education, health, livelihoods. But if you ask us what are we most proud of, and perhaps what are we best at, it is this transformative process of the community, where the community learns to take charge of their own lives. They determine what they want to do, and they actually are trained to find pathways to do it. And I think that is something I deeply believe in. The last thing to mention is, after much debate, all these have been debated and argued over the years, but we take a geographical approach. So we take an entire block, or entire seven blocks, or entire four blocks, and we work within those blocks. And the other, the last point that our philosophy has, which is what all of us mentioned, you mentioned it, and I know Amit is going to speak about it, is collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Don't do anything yourself that somebody else can do better. Collaborate with your community, collaborate with the government, with other NGOs, with corporate donors, whoever, but collaborate. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ruth uh, and Inakshi, for uh, inviting me here today. Uh, it's a tough act to follow both of these uh, amazing uh, philanthropists. Uh, <clears throat> you know, a lot of what both of them said uh, resonated with Arjuna and my uh, approach and philosophy as well. Uh, for us, uh, it is a combination of, of a head and the heart. Um, in terms of everything we do, we, uh, Arjuna spends 100% of her time in the social sector. Uh, she's very focused on the cause of uh, intellectual disabilities and works with uh, both children and adults running Jai Vakil, which is the largest and oldest institution in the country working in this space. Um, and I spend half my time um, in Bain Capital, the organization you introduced, but I also spend half my time running our family foundation. Uh, in terms of uh, approach, I think we're still learning. Uh, we've been active in the social sector now for about uh, 25 years, but I think uh, we still haven't uh, stabilized our approach, to be honest with you. It's uh, been an evolving approach uh, over, the, over the last 25 years. Uh, originally, we were very focused on education and health, and then we realized over time as we defined our, our vision um, that there was a lot of attention in that space, and so we decided that we'll focus on uh, areas that were truly underserved and where we thought we could actually make, bring some kind of a differential edge. And so over the last, uh, I would say, decade, uh, or pr primarily seven years, we've actually uh, started focusing less on education and, uh, and health and more on rural development and capacity building in the social sector, and those are the two main uh, verticals uh, in the foundation. Um, our approach uh, and our philosophy uh, is one of building movements and institutions um, and doing so in a manner that's, uh, like uh, Zarina said, deeply collaborative. I can't think of anything that we've done that has not been a collaborative. 
Our biggest investment, Ashoka University, is when we started was a handful of us and is now 150 people who have uh, you know, committed 1,500 crores. It's the largest collaborative uh, philanthropic endeavor in the country. Um, we have uh, one of our other large uh, commitments is the SRCC Children's Hospital, which is just less than a kilometer from here. Is again a collaborative uh, with you know uh, a dozen other families, um, and you know another um, a movement. And those are both examples of institutions. But even the movements that we've been involved with are. Uh, have generally been collaborators. We run one of the largest uh, movements focusing on water uh, for farmers in the country. This year we worked in 1,200 villages uh, of the country, and that's, again, a collaborative where we work both with the government and with, uh, with other donors. So nothing which we do is not a collaborative. Arnav is here from the Gates Foundation. We work very closely in building the philanthropic ecosystem with uh, the Gates Foundation. We work during COVID with them. So our approach is deeply uh, collaborative and deeply uh, analytical and research-based because, again, we don't come from a, f from a family where we have uh, had a lot of resources with us. We spend money as we earn it, and so we are very focused on social ROI, and uh, we, we have a board which holds us really accountable to the investments that we make on an on a annual basis. And so uh, we really want to make sure that every investment we are making is, um, is highly impactful uh, you know, when, uh, to the uh, commitment that we made when we make that investment. So uh, that's the approach uh, and the philosophy that we've had. Um, you know, it's still, as I said, evolving and work in progress. Can I, can I just follow up there and ask? So collaboration is, is, is a word that's used often. And I think it's deeply misunderstood because you can't just put people together and say, collaborate. Um, you really, it, it takes a lot of work. So I just wonder if you could, um, each of you actually, what, what, what's the secret sauce? What, what lends itself to an effective collaboration that you've learned about e over the years? Go ahead. You have sure. Um, I think, uh, there are some design principles that uh, I think are important in collaborators. I think one of the principles we follow is uh, the purpose has to be far more important than self. And so any of the co collaborators, be it institutions that we've helped build or movements that we are involved in building, uh, you will rarely find our name out there. Um, you know, if you go to Ashoka University, for example, you know, it's called Ashoka University and you won't find our family name anywhere. Um, you know, SRCC as well, we were the first donors who got committed to it and the project was languishing for a long time because there were other families who were willing to commit to it, but they all wanted it named after themselves. <laughs> and so uh, this is, it's important. I mean, I think for some people, it, legacy is really important. Our, uh, you know, we work now in, uh, over uh, 3,500 villages, we've done rejuvenation of water bodies, but there isn't a board with our name on in even one of the villages. Uh, you know, so I think the uh, when we work in collaborators, we want to make sure that it's more about the purpose than about you know the uh, you know about ourselves. Um, and that's fine. I think when you work by yourself, you can probably do that. But I think when you have a collaborative, that becomes very important. The second is the governance of a collaborative as well. Um, you know, it is effectively a multi-headed uh, joint venture. Right. And so the principles of running a joint venture, and you know, both of them know it because they've both been involved in joint ventures, really kicks in. Um, there's a lot of give and take. Um, and so, for example, again at Ashoka, we want to make sure there's no, irrespective of how much your commitment is, we have donors who've committed between two crores and 200 crores, but everyone has the same rights. Everyone has the same seat on the table. And none of those actually uh, transfer to the next uh, you know, generation. It's all comes more from who you are when you commit, made the commitment. And so the design principles in a collaborative actually become very, very important. Great. Serena? I think um, a, he spoke beautifully on this, but I think trust and transparency, I think without that, it's not going to last even 
beyond the day that you sat together, and shared values, if you can possibly do that. It's not very easy, actually, let me be honest. I find uh, collaboratives very hard. And even when I'm working with another NGO, I find it hard. And even if it's a vendor, an NGO who's a vendor, another not for profit, I find it very hard. So it's not easy. But trust and transparency and open communication. Something is not working, don't even keep 24 hours. Tell it straight away. This is not working. Please do correct it. Otherwise, the whole thing will collapse. Very true. I think you've heard enough on collaboration, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> Smart on. So you work on policy. How do you collaborate with government? Oh, that's a good question. Great question. Sorry, but you asked for it. Yeah, but that's, that's the right question. Well, I think, you know, I think everyone's on, put the basic principles down. I think for, especially with government, you have to win trust. There's no, there's no other way. And show them uh, that you have something to offer which is of value to them. Uh, I think on policy, especially, uh, there has been so much uh, that has happened around the world on energy, for instance. And you could say that for different fields also, that there's so much learning that happens uh, amongst, uh, especially amongst NGOs, if they want to collaborate. There's a lot of learning that's possible. And that is very valuable to government, I think, as what has worked, what has not worked. Uh, and I think they want an honest uh, opinion, basically. And if you can win that trust, you can do it. And uh, so the number of you know the organization that I'm connected with are working very closely with government. What the, very often what they want is they say we don't have the capacity. So can you give us your staff? Right. You see, and this is I think in some ways the sort of highest level of trust that they are willing to work with your staff and not take that as. Uh, sort of a threat to them in any way. Uh, but you really have to be an honest uh, opinion uh, giver. And give all the pros and cons. In policy, this is, uh, it's always about, uh, you know, uh, some, some uh, give and take has to be there in policy. You can't uh, win everything, either from the government side or from the entrepreneur's side. But slowly, I think government, uh, uh, when they see some uh, useful uh, benefit from the collaboration, they certainly do want more and more. Right. And that's more difficult to do because then, you know, that capacity doesn't always exist. So you have to build your own capacity to be able to help other people, especially the government. Well, I mean, one of the, the, the interesting things about India is that philanthropists here do recognize that they need to help build the capacity of government Right? Not just the, the, the nonprofits and not just within their own teams. But there's not really, a, it's not a clear exit strategy for that. I wonder, Ami and Zarina, can you give an example of when you helped to build the capacity of a government counterpart? And you know, was there a beginning, a middle, and an, and an end to that? Yeah, so we did it with, um, we did it with teacher training. Um, it started very well with great enthusiasm, and then of course COVID got in the way, and at that time we found it very difficult. Later on the digital thing happened, and we, we do remarkable work on Zoom actually. Um, but we did do it, but I don't think it's a sustainable route. Uh, we couldn't find a good exit strategy for our teacher training program. It's a very robust very beautiful, very empowering. You can go to the school before the teacher training, and everyone's, there's a whistle, and everyone stands in a straight line, and they stand like that. And after the teacher training, you go to the same school. It's joyous, it's fun. You can see the impact. But we couldn't sustain it. So I don't know how you can exit from something like that. That is my only, what we have not cracked. Yes. But there are some collaborations where we did beautiful work with the government. And as you said, it was trust. It was trust where we helped with their vaccinations in the most remote corners of Maharashtra. So that, that was very successful and had a clear exit strategy. So, uh, <clears throat> no, I think this is a great question and uh, I would just like to amplify on what uh, Jamshid originally started, uh, you know, started talking about. Um, so for a long time, you know, we felt that we should not engage with the government. And I must say in retrospect, that was 
naive and immature. Uh, because as you know, we started learning more and more, we realized that at the end of the day, uh, if you really want to make impact in this country, you have to engage with the government. And, and so I think that that aha uh -huh should have come to us much earlier, but it came to us at some point of time in our journey. Uh, I think it goes back to what the purpose for philanthropy should be, uh, you know, and I think there are some places where philanthropy can, you know, fill missing gaps that the government doesn't reach. Uh, in some cases, it can be to keep government honest, but I think a large part of it should be actually to inform uh, government policy, to take risks and demonstrate what's a better mousetrap, because the government is always going to be a bigger spender in all social uh, you know, spending by a massive, massive multiple, even if miraculously, suddenly, everyone in the country who wants to donate money is going to donate money to their full potential. And so even from our perspective, you know, we've realized that everything now that we do, we try to figure out where is it, whether it's at a state government level or a central government level, we can actually engage with them so that anyone who's interested can actually uh, you know, imbibe what we are doing into government policy and into a government program. And so, uh, you know, I'll, the one example I can give you uh, at this point of time is, for example, uh, our water program, where, you know, for many years we basically uh, were funding it by, uh, by ourselves along with, you know, a bunch of co-donors. But this year we went to the central government and we said, look, this program, we will continue to do it by ourselves. And we, are, we did uh, work in, you know, in, in three states by ourselves. But we said we're happy to, you know, because this is a big issue for you, we are happy to uh, run a pilot for you where we will spend on all the capacity building part of it, but you spend on the program part of it. So they actually had us run a pilot in six districts of three states, uh, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, and Rajasthan. And we actually worked with them uh, in these three states. And we actually were able to work in uh, nearly about 450 uh, you know, water bodies, which is about 550 villages for them. Now, this is their, uh, you know, district collectors and mechanisms working. And now that this has been a successful pilot, this can probably be scaled up into, you know, 15 states next year with, uh, you know, probably 10x the size. So I think demonstrating pilots, what's a better mousetrap, uh, and we are transferring our you know, technology app we have developed to them. We are transferring our SOPs to them. I think that, in my mind, is the opportunity. And, and, and how was it that your foundation was able to build that better mousetrap, build that better water it took It took nine years, eight, nine years of doing work in that area. Um, you know, so it takes time. And Jamshi is absolutely right. It's a slow, painful process. You have to build credibility. Uh, you have to, you know, the first time we approached them was actually three, four years ago. So it took us three, four years for them to take us seriously. Mm -hmm. But I think you have to be very patient. Zarina talked about this earlier as well. It's excruciating. But I think if you really care about about it, I mean, you these issues have persisted for decades. So things aren't going to happen miraculously overnight. I also think of one aspect which you touched on, which is which government are you going to work with? So you you have to decide, you know, do you want to need is this for the central, the state, or even the local district administration? For example, our bonds with the local district administration and the state government actually are super strong now, really strong. And we have had heroes upon heroes in the district administration who work just as hard as any Swadesh person. I have my Mangesh, my CEO here. I think he'll agree with me. We spend a lot of time with them. They're immensely dedicated. And the other small variant on this, not quite exactly what we were talking, very important, is to connect the community with the government. This is vital for change. If the community knows how to reach the, C, the, you know, the CEO or the BDO or any of the district officials themselves, your work is done. Well, you know, you spoke about risk capital, um, and that's the positive. The, the, the flip side of that is that philanthropy can fail. And government often doesn't want to fail, right? And, and, and feels failure is bad. They'll, they'll get voted out. So um, 
I wonder if any of you have an example of uh, essentially taking a risk, failing and learning from it that you wouldn't mind sharing with the uh, Oh, with I don't the mind. I mean, um... Oh. Now, see, the thing is, when we first started Swades, we knew we didn't know, okay? We knew we were learning. We knew we were going to fail. We did a lot of studies. We spent a whole year studying, actually. And at that point, A, we did not collaborate, and B, we didn't take anybody's money. Because for five years almost, we didn't take anyone's money because we knew and we made really mistake after mistake, tweak after tweak, from the smallest to the biggest. Of course, I'm not saying we didn't have successes, we did. But the biggest one, and now I've, then once we learned that, we started taking money and collaborating with the government, is to be community-centric. And we had, you know, a corporate approach earlier. You know, uh, we make a plan, and then we must stick to the plan. And so many goats, and so many cows, and so many toilets, and so much water. It must be done, whether the community wants it or not. You know, it was that. I'm exaggerating just a little bit. But it was very goal-driven. Right? It was just goal-driven. But it's not that. It has to come. So we call it push versus pull. It has to be a pull. The community needs to want it. You need to enable the community to want it. And Ruth, we spoke about this, about the worst thing that I have found in our journey is mental poverty. Mental poverty of the community is the biggest barrier for change. It is the sense of hopelessness that the community feels, that this lady feels, or this man, or this child. They have no dreams at all. And now we have created dream village after dream village because we've changed that essential thing. And once we did that, even the government is collaborating with us. I mean, corporates, we can stand on. We can say, yes, come join us. We know this is working now. Jamsha, did you have an example? No, but I think that, uh, you know, in the past, especially uh, when uh, any voluntary organization did something good, uh, very often the, the government officials, especially the local ones, felt very threatened, you know? And, uh, and I mean, I know of, personally know of uh, an initiative where uh, the government actually closed down, the local government closed down that initiative because they felt that the community became more trusting of that organization rather than the government. Mm -hmm. And they were losing face. The government officials were losing face in front of the community. So this, uh, this can happen. Uh, I think if you recognize that up front, I don't think you know in this particular instance anybody thought that uh, a local official would actually stop a good thing, but they did. Uh, uh, but I think you have to recognize that that is a possibility and build that trust first, you know, make sure. Uh, I mean, this, the example I'm giving you is that, that uh, it was a health initiative and they had an ambulance, but the government officials wanted to use the ambulance for their touring and uh, <laughs> for their, uh, you know, uh, the bed, poli politi yeah. politicking, et cetera. Yeah. And the organization was so sort of strict about it, they said, no, you will not touch my ambulance for that. Mm -hmm. So the next day they said, okay, you're out of here. <laughs> so this can happen. But I think people have... What's the solution to that? No, the Share solution the is... No, no. <laughs> oh. the solution is you've got to have that communication with the local organization what you what are you here for why are you here what are you what do you intend to do what is your role as a government what is my role as a voluntary organization if you have that understanding i think things work so uh, look the government has this morbid fear of failure um, and i think that's where it's very important for us as philanthropists and for the partner organizations we work with to understand that uh, we must accept failure. Because if you think about it, someone in the system has to fail if the system has to succeed. Right. I mean, you know, it's just impossible that everything's going to succeed. And if the government's going to play safe all the time, then who's going to basically you know, invest in innovation, be it products or services, uh, for the system to keep, you know, moving forward, right? It'll have to be people like us. 
Um, and I think that's, uh, that's something really important. So in my mind, it's critical that uh, people like us do not play safe. Uh, you know, and we take we take risks, and that when we are when we fail, we do not you know fear it, but we actually learn from it. And when we succeed, we you know really try to figure out how to templatize it and scale it up. Um, you know, when I look at things we've done, there are lots of examples over a long period of time of things that have not succeeded. We've not been great at uh, documenting, uh, you know, what the learnings are, but we are getting better at documenting learnings. Uh, you know, Arnav's here from Gates Foundation. He and I worked on something that failed. Um, and, you know, we used to exchange notes all the time on why it failed. It was really helpful because, you know, um, it's helped us learn and we are making a very similar bet this year because we've been able to shape how are we going to make the bet differently b because the learnings from that failure were actually pretty rich. So it's not, you know, it's not made us feel fearful about uh, making a bet again, but it, we're just, you know, we laid boundary conditions very differently for the next uh, venture that we decided to do, you know, and it's, it's been three, four years since we made that. So it's just, you know, we we back in it, and we are trying to do it differently this time. So I think, uh, uh, and you know, I think that's uh, it's very important to have those learnings. I will make one other point, which is, um, you know, a person I respect and admire a lot in the social sector who shaped a lot of my thinking is Venkat Krishnan. Um, and Venkat actually organizes a, organizes a failure conference every year, where he calls people who anyone who cares to share uh, their failure stories so others can learn from it. And I think that's a tremendous approach. Well, the Hewlett Foundation in the United States has Failure Week, um, where the whole <coughs> team gets together and comes clean. Um, in, China has these too, but they, I think the sentiment is a little bit different there. <laughs> um, so um, the three of you are extraordinary because you spend a lot of sweat equity in, and this is what you were saying at the beginning, in your philanthropic efforts. Um, is that necessary? Yes. <laughs> Essential. Absolutely. So the message to a philanthropist is you have to, you have to jump into the deep end, right? Okay. I want to say something here. Okay. okay. Firstly, I want to say anyone can be a philanthropist. And everyone, you don't have to be rich to give. And you can start young. See a lot of young faces here. It gives a lot of joy. You don't have to give your full time to it. You can give as much time as you wish, but give. Give your time, volunteer, mentor a child. Everyone can be a philanthropist. I, don't want, I, I just want to banish this thought of philanthropists yeah. being rich, old people who towards the end of their life decide, OK, now I'm going to, you know, I've da been there, done that, and now I'm going to do this. No, all of us can. And the younger we start, the more joyful our life is going to be. Good. No, no, I 100%. That was, that, that was good. And, and why don't we give a round of applause for that? <laughs> it's true. There, the, there are low barriers to entry to start giving. There are no barriers. There are no barriers to entry. Um, OK, so India is a complicated country. Um, I, I have been um, very um, blessed and honored in my life to be able to come here many times, but I find it intimidating. Um, it's complicated, it's diverse, and as soon as you have one example, they say, but in that state, it's not like that at all. Um, so maybe you have a handle on what's happening in Maharashtra, but Bihar, never. Um, so uh, what do you think is, are there, and, and, and we're living in a world where scale, 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 everybody talks about scale, and we want to scale this, and it's got, it can go beyond the borders of India. Are there idiosyncratic ways of doing things in this country that are really important to bear in mind when you're doing your philanthropy. And all of you have kind of worked across national borders, so what do you think? First of all, I don't think it's fair to paint Bihar the way you did. I just said I don't understand it. 
<laughs> I need to spend more time there, clearly. Actually, <laughs> in, in, our, in the work that we are doing on policy, Bihar is leading today on, on their policies on uh, many different types of uh, renewable energy, et cetera. And so I think, you know, it's, it's got to do, I think in government, and you should maybe call on some people like Sanjay who are here to uh, talk about it. You know, it's more about individuals who take a view and an interest in doing something, you know. And we've all heard this story about Surat, uh, where there was actually a plague, but the, the person who cleaned it up, mm -hmm. you know, uh, did a fantastic job. But after he left, it sort of regressed. So I think this individual uh, attention in government is, is, what, is one of the big drawbacks. And how does one sort of take everyone together, especially in government, is, is, is critical. Uh, and I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but I think, you know, the, what one must understand is the culture and, uh, you know, aspirations, uh, in each, uh, not just a state. I mean, the state is also a very big. Uh, Uttar Pradesh has how many million people? 120? No, no, no. No, more than that. Okay. <laughs> so it's it's a gigant. It's not about a state. It's about not only a district, but you know, getting down to the lowest uh, level, because the change will come from the bottom up. It won't really happen from the top down. So that, that is one thing to remember. Is that true elsewhere, or is that particularly true in India, do you think? No, I mean, I don't know as much about other countries, but I would assume that it's probably true everywhere. i give you an example. In our villages, um... we work, the village is the smallest entity we work with, but it is the only entity we work with. Because every village is different, and every village has very different problems and very different solutions. It could be geographical, it could be the lay of the land, could be the water body or the not the water body, particularly of the school, the distance. Every solution has to be local, unfortunately. Not in policy, perhaps, but in real ground level change, grassroots change. But the policy should the be policy has enough to, to take care of that. True, true. But yes, it has to be granular, local. I, I, I think so. I think so. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I think uh, Zarina said it very well. So, the, for example, the water work we do is uh, in now six or seven states. Um, and we work extensively with local partners in all of them. What you need to do is, you know, make sure that what Jamshid said, that the policy is flexible, but the implementation of it is, to Zarina's point, very, very local. So what, what, how does that play uh, in terms of, you know, on the ground? The tech app that we have uh, on which the entire, you know, work resides is multilingual. Mm -hmm. You cannot have, a, you know, a Hindi app or an English app. When we work in Karnataka, we have a Kannad app. Uh, same, it's the same tech platform in Maharashtra, it's a Marathi app. So, the, you know, similarly the training uh, SOPs and all are also multilingual. Uh, we try to make sure that when we work with partners in each of the states, the partners are often very, very locally grounded. So we are not trying to promote partners, uh, you know, and who are large organizations and tell them, why don't you, you know, you, you are capable because you're a big organization, cross borders and work with us in this state or that state. You actually work with people who really understand the local community because of what Zarina said. So it's very important to have the, you know, those, that local connect, the local sensibility combined with your, you know, uh, delivery mechanism, which has to be locally sensitive. So is it fair? Are, am I hearing that you guys all think that scale is a little bit overrated in a way? No, I think scale is an imperative. How you deliver scale has to be very thoughtful. So uh, scale has to, the notion of scale is widespread change, but taking into consideration yes. all these local yes. nuances. Yeah, and, and I'll make one more point, which is, um, you know, and it came up a little bit, in some ways, Jamshid addressed it. I mean, you work in Uttar Pradesh, you're working in, you know, a population which is half of Europe. I mean, you know, or a very uh, half of US. So many of India's states offer you 
incredible state, uh, you know, scale. I mean, the work, sh you know, they're doing in Raigad, for example, population of Raigad alone is what, two million? Yeah, yeah. I mean, how, how much is Mangi? One million people. I mean, imagine you deliver change with one million people. That's not trivial, right? I mean, so in India, the notion of scale also needs to be recalibrated. Our states are, many of our states are more than 100 million people. We don't realize Maharashtra is more than 100 million people. Uttar Pradesh is more than 200 million people. So I think we have to understand that you get, even if you choose one geography, you get incredible opportunity yes. to work on scale. Yes. Yeah. It is a big country with a lot of people. Are you going to allow the audience to ask a question? Well, you're tired of my questions. I was just about to. What, what a way. So, so subtle. Yes. I was just about to do that very thing. Oh. OK. Um, this gentleman right here. Thank you for this engaging discussion, Dr. Shapiro. So I'm familiar with India because I live here and I know the ecosystem, but I would like to know from you what China has done, which is amazing, you know, shot up its per capita income. All governments are dictatorial in Asia, but they have done something much better than other governments in Asia. Can you share what they have done? Um, thank you for that question. Yes, um, the Chinese government is an authoritarian government and they have figured out how to channel all the resources toward their five-year plans. So you may know that from 2015 to 2020, um, Xi Jinping announced that his goal was to alleviate absolute poverty in the country, just completely. And it was $2.30 a day, and they created databases down to the actual household, and they um, were able to assign the state-owned enterprises to the 832 poorest uh, counties. Private companies volunteered, like Alibaba and Tencent, to also go into those areas. Um, philanthropy went into those areas, and the government acted as the, I would say, the conductor of the orchestra. Um, so everyone's on stage, and they get the violins and the cymbals to work together, such that by December 2019, they were able to declare victory that there was not one person in China that had below $2.30 a day. The question is, and some of that, frankly, was direct cash transfers, so, um, which they did. Not all of it, most of those direct cash uh, Transfers were health-related. Um, now they have moved to rural revitalization. And interestingly, a lot of their plans sound somewhat similar to what Swadis Foundation is doing. They, but they get scale, and they do it on a massive level. And even the private company, so Alibaba, before it even got in trouble, spent a, they, they were able to mobilize a billion US dollars a year that came from the personal philanthropy of the owners, the CSR of the company, the company's R&D, and government um, uh, sources. They went and they built a ton of small businesses in these poor areas, and they put those small businesses on their Taobao trading site, which ended up benefiting Alibaba. So they have created kind of virtuous circles in that way. Um, and if you're really interested, we do these, we've done China issue guides, which really look at the granular level how this money has been deployed. But um, it is a command and control country, and the government is, is the conductor. Thank you. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. And this question is for the panel. It can be anybody. Yeah. Sorry. I'm Jyoti Narang. This question is for the panel, and anybody can answer that. And both my questions relate to collaboration. The first is that there is a lot of companies, CSR money still lying around. A lot of it goes to the PM care fund or a CM care fund for political reasons. But sometimes it also goes because the companies don't know what else to do with it. Some of it gets funneled into personal stuff, but there is still a lot which is being rolled over in large number of companies because they don't know what to do with it. They don't necessarily want to give it to somebody else's foundation. 
they all want to do something themselves. So they go to what they call CSR consulting agencies to figure out who to collaborate so with. Can I ask what your question is? My question is, is there a way that a list of nonprofits that are working in specific sectors is easily available and graded for somebody who wants to do work, do it themselves but collaborate? That's my first question. My second question is, there still appears to be a lot of reinventing the wheel in India. There was some time ago, a long time ago, when I knew that the Gates Foundation organized something in Bangalore across many themes, and a lot of people came. But despite all efforts, a lot of nonprofits working in the same sectors are reinventing stuff. Is there a way that people can collaborate to avoid that? Those are my two questions. Thank you. <coughs> Anybody can answer. I think uh, on the first part of your, your question, my, my own sense is that the contributions to um, things like PM care and CM care is now declining meaningfully uh, with, you know, us seeing the back of... Uh, back of COVID, famous last words. Uh, but I think that's that's happening. Uh, at least the data that I've seen, I think also the uh, utilization of CSR has actually meaningfully gone up. So it's now close to uh, 2%. It's, it's somewhere around 1.9%. So uh, I think people are beginning to now uh, make use of their, uh, of their utilizations. Um, Yes, I think there are some people who you know would like uh, access uh, to to better information so they can give more thoughtfully. But I think that's more the mid-sized companies than the larger size companies. And I think there are for anyone who wants to make the effort, I think there are lots of sources available. I mean, you can go to the Give India website and you'll get you know more than 500 organizations that you can choose from, and you can sort them out by sectors and by geographies, and you know uh, you can do the same thing on GuideStar and look at their platinum lists, and you can you know call Dasra and they will help you out. And so I think for anyone who really wants, uh, there are enough organizations who will you know help you out and uh, I, I don't think if someone still has an issue I think it's because my, I honestly believe they're lazy um, you know otherwise you can really get uh, high quality uh, qu quality information yeah sorry it was a question actually maybe to the panel but a little bit of a clarification Ruth I came in a little late but I heard your strong comments on the government. So a little bit more of a perspective. And, and a, you know, I think you know, we have to look at India in a very different way, um, and not from an outsider's perspective. We're all here as insiders. You mentioned something on tax incentives. I don't think it's the government's job to give tax incentives. Um, to take a state government or a state country like Singapore and benchmark that with India really is not uh, relevant. 2% CSR, which the government has introduced, actually, has actually done tremendous amount of work for bringing awareness. And I think that's the best move that they can make. I don't think necessarily uh, at this level of our CSR we need to do. I think you also brought up the point of government, what is the message the government is spending, where in China they're giving it out to the public, and here there's very little grants going. 75% of our union budget actually goes into grants that the government gives out directly. Uh, and respectfully, in China, most of the collaborations are with other uh, government companies completely. So I think that's a little bit out of context for us in India. I just thought I wanted to put that there. I, I appreciate that. I actually said that the government does give grants here. It's procurement that doesn't happen as much. But the government does give grants, and I don't remember the number specifically, but it was significant. My only point about taxes is, and, and Ashoka University actually just did a study on taxes, where they said we can't really find that there's a direct benefit of these taxes. Because, and if you ask any philanthropist and say, are tax incentives the reason you give? 100% of the time they're gonna say but no. But respectfully, if I can say so, in the US 90% goes to the church and to colleges who don't need it. So it really doesn't go totally to the needy. That's my outsider's perspective on the U.S. country versus the U.S. outsider's perspective on India. Okay. Um, I'm not... I'm, I, this is, yes, this is a study. My, our point about taxes is it's a way for government to signal 
the value they place in making charitable donations? And do they, Singapore is an odd duck, of course, it's a city. So, you know, is it benchmarked against anybody? And then, by the way, there's only 1,000 nonprofits in the entire city, so that money kind of sloshes around in the little Singaporean teacup. No question about that. It's just that government messaging is important, and it's very important in India, too. So when the government has a clear and consistent support for the sector, it's good for the sector. And, that, and the CSR legislation is part of that, but there's other ways to signal support for the sector. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think, uh, um, Zareen, you mentioned about giving back. It's not uh, uh, just at the stage that you are rich and you can sort of give back. So I, I've always thought of philanthropy as uh, three T's. You give back your time, you give back your talent, and you give back your treasure when you have it. And it goes in this sequence. As you're young, you give your time and you give your talent as you become much more mature. And then, of course, when you've earned enough, you give back whatever you've earned and whatever you can share. Uh, this leads to whether in our country, where there is uh, enough of time available with youngsters, and there is not a, a lot of intellectual capacity as they sort of grow, whether we've been able to harness our youngsters adequately enough so that they can then play a big role in giving back, which is their time at the, and this whole thing about volunteerism, right across the country. Uh, we have a huge latent force that is available there to be utilized to play a role in bringing that social change, the awareness. And then, of course, is the entire contribution of the intellectual knowledge, the talent of influencing the villages in terms of what is the social good. And then, of course, you come back with the contributions that are required to bring the capital for that social change. Now, these three aspects need to be working in unison to really make a social impact. And we have all the ingredients so is, available. Is your question whether My, or not they are? No. What is it that we can do to collectively make this impact far more bigger than what we have today? That was my question to Thank the panelists. You. I just think volunteering is not up to the mark yet. Um, <laughs> I think uh, what you said is very valid. There are a lot of young people in the audience, and all of you are obviously volunteering or working with some organizations. I think um, it's not only about young people. Anyone and everyone can volunteer. And I do agree that this is not something we've harnessed sufficiently. And if it can be harnessed, I, I mean, we have, uh, for example, I'm sorry, I keep giving village examples, but that's where I work. Um, uh, at the core of the change is what we call the Village Development Committee. Ten ladies, ten men, two youths. And then they form subcommittees, and they look after the entire running of the village and the dreams of the village, and going door to door to door to door to door to talk to each person, check their eyes. They do multiple things. Here we have harnessed volunteering beautifully. And so far, we have about 10,000 such volunteers, yes? And that is a huge, uh, huge benefit, huge change. And they are the ones who then bring on other villages and say, come and see what we're doing. Peer-to-peer -peer communication is beautiful. But I do agree with you. I think it is a very important point. Volunteering is something that we haven't harnessed to its fullest capacity. I do agree. Can I? So, uh, you know, I think you, you raise an important uh, you know, question. My generation, when we were growing up, I think we often heard the, f the phrase that, you know, life is divided into three phases, learning, earning, and giving. And, you know, I've, I personally, I, I've always challenged that, that, you know, that notion. And I actually agree with you. I think, you know, uh, we can't build a sustainable society and an equitable society if we look at life from that, with that lens. And I think actually part of the reason we have the problems that we have in India is that my generation in particular grew up 
thinking about life that way. And by the time most people got to their giving phase, they forgot about giving. I think we are now having a resurgence where, uh, uh, and I use the word resurgence because I do think that at least when you, uh, you know, read history, uh, you realize that going back 100 plus years, we had a rich tradition where people thought about these things with a little bit more balance. Um, you know, that's exactly why the Tata Trusts were founded. Uh, even if you look at the, you know, the little I've read about the Godrish family history, 25% of the wealth was put into a trust. You actually read a lot of our wealth creators actually thought of things in a more sustainable way and it wasn't necessarily in this way that in the 70s, 80s and 90s people thought about I'll create enough wealth and then I'll start giving it and no one actually gave it away. I think the current generation, I have a lot more hope. When I engage with youngsters and, you know, uh, uh, for example, when I visit universities, I actually think that they think of things in a much more sustainable way. I also engage with entrepreneurs a lot, um, you know, by virtue of my work. The, the young entrepreneurs also think about wealth very differently from the, you know, entrepreneurs of my generation. So I have a little bit more optimism on this front, and I think it's going to be much more in unison with you know all three going hand in hand. But it's going to go back to where it was, probably. We have um, this gentleman in, way in the back. Yeah. And then the next one is, is back over here, and then this lady here in the blue and white. Hi. Uh, my name is Shore Watwani. Yeah, my name is Shore Watwani. First of all, thank you so much for an incredible and engaging discussion. My question is, you know, keeping in mind the economic and especially social uh, state of the world right now, India is pushing towards becoming a more self-sufficient country while also establishing itself as a trade hub globally. How, in your opinion, do you think India can do the same thing in a more social and philanthropic uh, lens with the FCRA and sub regulations in place right now? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Who wants to tackle that? <laughs> and I can answer. So I think, uh, let's look at the data first of all, and I think I would like to begin with the point Ronnie was making. If you look at philanthropy per se, uh, philanthropy in India has actually grown. It's grown less than what some of us would like, uh, but it's actually grown at a reasonable pace over the last uh, you know, decade. Um, what's changed is the mix of it. One major component which has come in is CSR, and that's the point Ronnie was making. This year, I think CSR will be about 20,000 crores. The other thing that has you know, really happened is that domestic philanthropy, which is in, uh, individuals, foundations, has really powered ahead, and that's growing at a very rapid pace. If you look at uh, FCRA, uh, the FCRA numbers actually haven't dropped. They've just been stagnant. And so, therefore, their share of the overall pie, because you know these other two numbers are going at a rapid pace, that share of the overall pie is actually declining. Now, of course, I mean, as a less developed country, we take every we should take every dollar we get or every pound we get. But you should step back and think about it as well, which is, do we really not have the local resources to uh, power the programs that we all dream of uh, for social equity and justice? Uh, shouldn't it be the responsibility of Indians to build a more equitable India? Why was it the responsibility of you know, just foreign foundations to come out here and do that, which is what was happening for a long period of time? And so I think in some ways, while of course we you know, this has become a hot topic and everyone's criticizing it. I think in many ways it's also putting pressure on uh, Indians to step up and solve the problems which we should have been solving for a long period of time. And, and actually this is one of the major impetuses for CAPS, my organization, to do this work. Um, the rule of thumb is that Americans spend approximately 2%, um, the equivalent of 2% of GDP on philanthropy. Some of it goes to churches and universities, but not, not all. Um, if Asia, if the 18 economies in our study um, were to spend 2%, get to 2%, and there's no reason why we can't, you can't, 
it would be 14 times the amount of foreign aid and private aid that comes into this region. Um, and I think that there are eight economy, eight countries that are pushing back on foreign money, like FCRA. India is only one of eight. And the notion is that we need to galvanize local support for local needs. The other reason that foreign money is going down is because Asia is becoming richer. And so um, why give money to China when China is sending people to the moon? Why give money to Vietnam when their per capita income is upper middle class, uh, middle income? So there's some really significant demographic and economic changes happening in the region, which means that a lot of local support, per your point. I just want to ask this man in the yellow, way in the back, um, who, who, who missed out before. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Manish. I was just curious to understand um, what, where you see from a capacity building perspective, um, is the problem in the front end, in the delivery of social services, or in the back end, where it's about the back end support in terms of finance, marketing, technology, HR, what, if, where's the gap? And is because you, if you if you have a fan, you can't really deliver social service unless you have a robust back end to enable the front end. So, are we spending enough time on the back end as much as we're spending on the front end? My answer is the answer is yes. You need to do the front and the back. Um, we're not spending enough. Um, yeah sector, we should spend more on technology, but not, um, but not only. <laughs> I mean, there's a multitude of things, right? No, I mean, go ahead. m and &E, for instance. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think, uh, look, this is, this is a very important area that requires uh, significant investment, and I would say across the spectrum. Um, I would begin actually right at the top, which is simply the ecosystem that all of us, you know, three of us come from uh, the corp uh, corporate background. Things that we are completely used to seeing in the corporate world, uh, we, you know, when we, I think, descended into the social sector, many of those things were basically missing. We ascended, yeah. we ascended. Asc sorry, ascended. <laughs> I meant descended by, you know, started working because we first started in the corporate world. <laughs> it's simply missing, right? I mean, um, so, you know, financial, the financial system, you want to raise money, there's no exchange. Uh, knowledge, uh, if you, you know, knowledge hubs, missing. Uh, consulting organizations, missing. And so one of the things, you know, we focused on, started focusing on 15 years ago, was making systemic investments in institutions that would serve the uh, ecosystem itself. We worked with Gates Foundation to make a big investment in Give India as one of the largest investments we made going back, I don't know about how many years ago? Uh, four years ago. So, you know, between Gates, Omidya, and us, we wrote a 30 crore investment to Give India. That year, Give India used to channel 30 crores a year into the, uh, into the ecosystem. Last year, Give India channeled 1,000 crores. So, investments that you make into building institutions serve, lift the whole sector. Similarly, we've worked with other uh, organizations, including Gates and many others, to build other ecosystem players, uh, Britspan, IDR, CSIP, etc. So it's important to look at the whole map, the map of organizations that we're used to seeing in the corporate world and seeing what's missing in the social sector. In some cases, you need more of them in the social sector, and then making those investments to ensure they're save, uh, served. The other area we realized is, you know, we have great expectations from social sector leaders, but in the corporate world, we were just used to getting talent, and this Ruth had this up on her slide, that talent, you know, is a big, big issue. We have far more committed people in the social sector than in the corporate world, but whether they, are they equipped with the tools to deal with far more difficult challenges you know, and that's, that was a big issue. So we've been investing in training programs. Um, you know, every year we work with 12 training programs. We train about 500 social sector leaders. So I think it's important to invest across the board in technology, in m and &E, in building institutions, in training. Uh, that's the only way you'll be able to, you know, uh, address this problem. Um, since we're running out of time, there were three over here who asked, who had questions. 
I'm going to go ahead and ask you to say them one after the other, and maybe in our summarizing comments, we can take those into consideration. So um, the three, I know it was this lady in the blue and white blouse, and there were two other people, and this lady in yellow, and there was someone else back there. Um, the gentleman with his hand up. OK. Uh, my name is Dr. Anita. I'm from Pukar. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, give a big hand to the philanthropist of our country. Finally, they have started actually building capacities of organizations like ours. And a classic example is the Grow Fund. I'm sure some of you or many of you or all of you are familiar and contributed to it. So thank you very much for that because we are privileged to have received the support. Uh, question to Zarina. Our experience with the Zilla Parishad or BDOs and CEO in Palgar is that because we do such a brilliant job of uh, collecting data and handing it over to them, uh, for the last six years, that's all we have done, and they don't support us. It's like, okay. no. Oh, more and more umed program, and they say, okay, you do more, you do more, you all do right, more. Well, I, I, I'll, we put her on the spot, but let, can you hand the, the mic to, uh, yes, yeah. this lady? Um, and just ask your question as succinctly as you can. Okay, my name is Uma Kogekar, and we're also a recipient of the Grow Fund. My question is to the panelists. You talked about celebrating failures um, so as philanthropists, when you support organizations, and if they fail, do you continue to support them if they haven't been able to show the impact indicators and because the challenges on the ground are very complex? That's so that's the question. question. And then one gentleman in the back here, yeah, with the glasses. Hi, I'm Fatima Varman. So my question was for Zarina, ma'am. So you, you said like a holistic 360 approach for any village. So if you ask anybody in the audience right now, they'll give you 360 different ways. So how do you say the first to the last step? Like how do you plan it out? And secondly, how do you sustain it, say, over a period of five to 10 years after doing the basic work? Sorry, sorry that was the last point? My point was like, how do you sustain it over a period of five to 10 years after doing the basic groundwork? OK. And, 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 okay. And just <laughs> the original, question. The <laughs> Thank original you. gentleman with the glasses back there, you're the last question. So just um, as succinctly as possible, please. He has a question. He can ask. No? OK. So if you could take those into consideration in your um, closing remarks. Um, you, you, you were chomping at the bit, I mean. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. OK, closing remarks. Um, see, I think we have to understand that this work is very special, but it's also very difficult. And there are lots of failures. And, there are, and you just have to pick yourself up. So certainly if an organization fails, such as ourselves, would a donor come back to us? Yes, they do. When do they come back? Because they see that we recognize it, and we change. And we take well thought out steps to change. It's as simple as that. Failure cannot be, uh, you know, Rani's written a book, and he said, uh, failure's a comma, not a full stop. So I, I really, and we really believe that. We, we actually, I don't say we treasure failure, but without failure, you cannot move. So don't be frightened of it. You are going to fail for sure. If you're doing anything meaningful, you are going to fail. And then you're going to pick yourself up, and then you're going to win. But it's very rare that you try something and you immediately win. In fact, I think it's a great disservice you're doing to yourself. Please fail, and then pick yourself up, take your learnings, treasure your failure, learn from it, tweak and then, then start winning. And one more thing I want to say is, when you start your journey, first go slow. Go slow. Stay small. Check, check, check. Value your community. Take feedback. Try and be honest. Really stay small. Experiment, tweak, and then go. Then start running. Take your time initially. Okay? Because you may not even like what you've decided to do. You may say, you know, I thought about education, but I realized, no, I think I'll go into health. So, so, so when you start your philanthropic journey, take it easy. Go slow. Don't be too ambitious. Start carefully, and then start running. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
No, I think the, Zarina make, made a great point on um, on failure, and I think we've actually supported, uh, I, I continued working with, uh, supported is the wrong word, uh, continued working with organizations who have, uh, you know, who have not been able to uh, deliver something that we had an understanding that they would deliver. And I wouldn't call that failure. Uh, it's just that, you know, things didn't work out. Uh, you have to be very clear that, um, you know, why that happened. If it happened for integrity reasons, then we are very clear we would not engage with that organization to happen because of, you know, bad communication, then that also makes us very fearful. But if it happened because of some other reason, I think we would always go back and still uh, engage with the organization. I think there are lots of examples between the partners we worked with that, that continues to happen. Um, you know, I'm sure, like, you know, we've, we've been working uh, on, on the Grow Fund with, uh, with a bunch of other partners. I'm sure that the results won't be even across all the organizations that we've, that we've funded. But that doesn't mean that, you know, uh, the ones who don't, you know, uh, do as well as the top performers in that group will have failed. I mean, there'll be lots of rich learnings because the whole point is that how do you invest in capacity and that's part of the objectives of the fund that take learnings from this um, fund and figure out how, you know, the rest of the sector can benefit. So I think, uh, you know, I think that's one of the things that we've learned that you have to, uh, you have to keep learning and you have to keep disseminating those learnings for the you know, benefit of wider society. And that's uh, part of our approach. Yeah. So, you know, I just, uh, in my closing remarks, want to mention that uh, there's always a huge amount of uh, enthusiasm to do good. And we are seeing that, you know. And, uh, and India is actually blessed with the largest uh, number of sort of voluntary organizations. And uh, they are in every sphere. And I think that, uh, you know, this collaboration idea is so important because we see that uh, the number of uh, voluntary organizations with two, three, five people, you know, they just proliferate. Uh, so how do we sort of work to build scale, which will only happen when we collaborate, because you can't expect, you know, a two-person organization to become a 200-person organization overnight. So I think this is a, a good thought for all of us as to how we do that, because I think a lot of effort otherwise goes wasted. This is this is what I have felt. And the second point that I just want to make is that, <clears throat> you know. Uh, a lot of work is done on the ground, you know, as you do and others do. Uh, I think somewhere we must also have more uh, uh, organizations involved in policy, because uh, if we if we don't look at how uh, in better policies are going to actually be able to deliver what you know all the voluntary organizations are trying to do, you're stepping in because there's a failure, right? I mean. It's not your responsibility or Amit's or mine or anyone's to do the type of uh, work that we do. But we do it because we believe in it and we believe it's good for the country. But policy work, I think, needs to take uh, some importance in terms of uh, being given adequate uh, attention. Because I think, you know, as, as the old adage goes, you know, if you teach a person how to fish, you know, they're not going to be hungry. But uh, so I think this is the point which I just want to leave at the end of, uh, that we need to spend more time on thinking about what are the good policies and debate them. I mean, nobody has the right answer until you all collectively find solutions to it. Great. So that was my closing comment. Okay. I think we can all agree that this is these three people have given us a lot of reason to um, be appreciative of your work, great examples, food for thought, and an, and an inspiration to us all. So thank you, thank you so much. <laughs>